So, welcome to spring semester, though my heavens, it feels like it's rolling along and, and we're almost uh, ready to start planning commencement. Uh, this seemed like a great opportunity to share with you some of the great things that are happening at University of the Pacific. I look forward to bragging about some of our external recognition, talking about the great progress we've made as a university, and especially as a three-city university. And then I'd like to... Now, there is this, I hate rankings. Don't we all hate rankings? The US news is terrible. We don't want to pay any attention to it. And we don't let rankings govern the work that we do. We decide what we should be doing on what's best for our students and for our organization. Um, and in fact, you are probably share with my um, concern uh, when the White House developed the White House scorecard, where it was looking at some objective data, but also associating salaries as an indication, uh, of salaries of alums, as an indication of the quality of the institution. And in fact, I took many an opportunity to publicly declare that this was a mistake in my role as the head of the private universities of the state of California. I made the case to the Department of Education that it was short-sighted because the quality of a higher education degree prepares effective citizens and people for meaningful lives that couldn't be measured by the amount of money they earn. Um, but gosh, when the White House scorecard information came out and when it was analyzed, we ended up looking so good <laughs> that I'm facing a conundrum. But I'm going to tell you this story anyway because I think it has a powerful message. So the Brookings Institute and The Economist looked at the White House scorecard data. And what they asked was, what universities really make the biggest difference in a student's life in terms of their <laughs> potential earning power? You can just imagine, Harvard's entering freshman class, our stereotype, a bunch of rich, privileged kids come in, they get an education, and they go out as a bunch of rich, privileged kids. So it's not surprising that they make a lot of money. I know, I'm being overly simplistic. But what the Brookings Institute and the Economist did is they looked at the characteristics of students entering all, I think it was about 1,400 institutions across the US, four-year institutions. One of them did four years, the other did all. And then looked at the salaries 10 years out. And they were able to look at loan and characteristic Pell Grant eligibility of the incoming students. And they did an average salary that you would expect that student cohort to have when they graduate. And what's fascinating is that University of the Pacific, in both of these studies, came out as being the third most uh, uh, of, of California <coughs> universities, private and public, of being ranked third for the greatest positive impact we have on our students' future, earning power. And in fact, the economist um, actually ranked us 12th nationally for giving the students that come in to our baccalaureate program a greater step up in their earning power than they would have gotten if they had attended an average university in the country. Now, we all know that an education of Pacific is so much more than the salary somebody's going to earn when they graduate. But it is very reassuring that when our students come in, and so many of our students, this is a huge stretch and a huge challenge for their families to afford, that we're able to share with them with great confidence that an education from University of the Pacific is an extraordinarily important step 
for them shaping a strong future for themselves. There's other ways in which University of the Pacific has been recognized externally. And I'm going to list a few of them in the form of grants. Now the reason grants are important is because these are highly competitive. And we're putting in a proposal against universities across the country. And I'd like to give a shout out to a number that we've received this year. The College of the Pacific, Craig Vieira, and team got a National Science Foundation major research instrumentation grant of $500,000 that allowed our sciences to purchase a mass spectrometer that's helping not just biology and chemistry, also physics and engineering and pharmacy. Huge impact. Our Bennard School and the College of the Pacific Math Department have partnered uh, and Dennis Parker is the PI on a $500,000 grant from the California Department of Education to enhance math education in rural public and charter schools. We received a very prestigious grant from, from the National Institute of Health for $316,000 for Professor Guo in the T.J. Long School of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, and he's doing research on, sorry, I, I will try to capture this, but basically the uh, intercellular protein delivery mechanisms. Uh, Jennifer Torres and Scott Biederman deserve a shout out for us receiving an Irvine Foundation grant of $300,000 for the Beyond Our Gates efforts to enhance <coughs> literacy. The Irvine Foundation is an extremely prestigious foundation and it is groundbreaking to have a grant come in to this region of the Central Valley. They hadn't been investing in the Central Valley in a long time, started in Fresno about five years ago, and this is the first one up in our region. We have a great success, success grant from the Department of Education, thanks to the team in Student Life, $1.4 million to help support retention of our students at greatest risk and need for support. The cohort of students who participate in our success program have a 92% graduation rate. And a shout out to Paul Glassman in our Dagoni School of Dentistry. He received a $1.5 million grant from the California Department of Public Health. Now, Dr. Glassman has been a groundbreaker in teledentistry that will allow people to have dental care by dentists who might be at a long distance, but they aren't able to access the dental care directly from a dentist regionally. And so he is actually leading an effort, the first cohort of dentists and dental hygienists who will be working together to provide dental access for people who otherwise would not have access to any of that. Let's give a recognition to those great <laughs> We've also made excellent progress here at the university moving forward in so many important ways. Last year, the academic plan crossing boundaries was developed, and this year there's been a tremendous amount of effort in that direction. Part of that plan and part of our commitment is to celebrate the liberal arts. I like to think of the liberal arts as the heart of University of the Pacific. And the College of the Pacific faculty got together and crafted a powerful statement that captures the nature of a liberal arts education at University of the Pacific that features experiential learning, student and faculty collaborative research, and community engagement as guiding principles. I think that's a powerful characterization of what makes studying the liberal arts as well as studying any major at University of the Pacific so much better because of this strong liberal arts program. There's 
a tremendous amount of work going on in developing a water and environmental academic efforts that combine not just teaching and learning, but also scholarship, as well as an initiative around health. And so we're looking forward to hearing more about that this spring. These and other efforts of continually reflecting and improving in our academic programs and the scholarship that helps inform our teaching and create a vibrant faculty is what's helping an education at University of the Pacific to be second to none. We have other accomplishments in this, this year that I'd like to do some shout outs. We have a Title IX policy. This was no um, minor task, and I would like to thank Patrick Day, Lynn King, uh, all the members of the Title IX Committee, as well as the Academic Council and many other groups that have come together and helped us create a single Title IX policy that applies across our three campuses. This is extremely important because this policy clarifies consistent processes and is in compliance with federal and state expectations. The policy and the T Title IX committee recommends that we form a Title IX coordinator. This person is, their primary responsibility is to make sure that we understand this policy and that we as an organization can do everything we can to help prevent sexual assaults among the people that are part of our organization. Now, will the, is this policy right now perfect? No. And in fact, what we are also creating is a coordinating council that will collect feedback and to find ways in which we can continually improve this policy over time. But congratulations, it's a major milestone and extremely important to all the people at University of the Pacific. So thank you all. I'd like to thank all of you who participated in our climate uh, reviews last fall. The provost held a number of conversations with the faculty, both through the academic council as well as in the individual schools and the college. I'd also like to thank the staff that have participated in many large and smaller discussions about ways in which we can enhance the climate of work at University of the Pacific. Just to let you know what's happening right now is we have two groups working on making recommendations of what the most important actions are that we can take. I'd like to recognize the Academic Council and their effort in this, toward this from a faculty perspective and to thank our uh, leader of our staff advisory council, Becky Davis, as well as many others who are on that group. They're doing great things, and I'm looking forward to hearing their recommendations. I'm pleased to announce, while this isn't technically an accomplishment from an institutional perspective, I think we can say it is important, um, Greg Walters will be joining us on February 19th. Greg is going to be our new university-wide HR director, and Greg is going to help us build, continue to build an organization that inspires, challenges, and supports our employees to not only achieve their best, you as individuals, but also help our institution become its best. Now, recognizing the importance of our people to our organization's success, I have invited Greg to serve on the President's Cabinet as well as the President's Advisory Council to make sure that he is part of all of the important conversation, not the only important, but so that he is part of leadership discussions that help guide the actions and the directions that we take. 
There's so much other good things that are happening from the work on shared governance to the work on diversity and many in between that I don't have time to talk about all of them. So please forgive me if by the end of today, I haven't highlighted the work that you're doing right now, but recognize it's extremely important and exciting. Um, what I'd like to do is spend a good amount of time talking about our progress in becoming a three-city university. Now, for those of you who aren't used to that term, let me reflect that for the last 50 years, we have been a university with a presence in three cities. We have our campus here in Stockton where our undergraduates are and a number of our graduate programs are. And then we've had the dental school and the law school in San Francisco and Sacramento respectively. And what we've been doing is strategically recognizing that our fabulous specific education shouldn't just be constrained predominantly to students who can reside here in Stockton to pursue their education, but that we should be bringing the education to where many students are, such as San Francisco and Sacramento, and take advantage of our reputation and our presence in both of those cities. So we've been developing added programs to expand the graduate students we serve in those two cities and here in Stockton. Now, what makes it a little bit more challenging is that many of the graduate students, and in fact, many of the, much of the growth in students as we go forward are adults. Adults recognizing that lifelong learning is key to their future. But people who are working, and so they need to pursue that education part-time, in the evenings, or on weekends. We're also expanding our graduate programs to people who can take a full-time program as an adult. And so we have a greater mix now in the type of students that we serve, because honestly, We've been pretty used to educating full-time students. The exception to that is the McGeorge School of Law that has uh, had programs for working adults actually since it was founded in 1924. Full-time students at the law school came much later in the 1960s. The other school that's really good at this part-time uh, working adult uh, education business has been the Bennard School. The Bennard School has been offering graduate programs, not just here in Stockton, but to cohorts across the state and even across the world, Shanghai, for example. So we have that knowledge internally, but there's a lot of changes that are happening, both as we develop the new programs and as we find ways we can best serve these students that we're educating. Now, sorry. I have been asked to talk about our strategic investment fund. What's happened with that fund that we all worked so hard to reallocate funds to help create? So I'm going to talk about the story of our growth as a three-city university in the context, actually, of the strategic investment fund. So Eberhardt School of Business started a wonderful accounting program, baccalaureate and masters. It's attracted wonderful students, expanding Eberhardt's strong reputation. And the Eberhardt School, through strategic investment funds, are going to be able to hire additional faculty so that they can expand the graduate students that they're serving. Through the strategic investment fund, McGeorge has been able to build a new identity lawyers for what's next. McGeorge is exceeding, has exceeded their enrollment projections for this fall. And in their bar exam results from last July, their bar passage went up nine points to 70% above the state average for ABA law schools. These are two significant 
accomplishments for the law school and reflect the strength in the law school having clarity and who they are, who they serve, and making a difference for the future lawyers. In addition, through strategic investment fund support, they're adding a master's in public policy and a master's in public administration to be offered in Sacramento starting next fall. At the Dagoni School, there's a master, uh, I call it a physician assistant PA, but master of science in physician assistant program that is being offered in Sacramento. That program is started because of investments from the Strategic Investment Fund that has allowed renovation of space as well as hiring of the faculty, which all needs to be in place for accreditation so that new students can start arriving next January. While these numbers move almost daily, the demand for that program is mind-boggling. There are 40 slots and we have had more than 1,800 people express interest in this program. I think it's about 600 fully completed applications. We don't envy them in selection and interviewing and just winnowing that down to only 40. Well, yes, maybe we'd all want it. What a problem to have. Um, uh, the Eberhardt School is now offering an MBA in Sacramento, as well as here in Stockton. The TJ Long School of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, through SIF Investments, are offer, is offering a doctorate of audiology in San Francisco. The Conservatory of Music, through SIF Investments, has a music therapy post-back study in San Francisco, which allows someone who is a music major to take post-baccalaureate courses and then sit for a certificate to be a music therapist. The College of the Pacific, through SIF Investments, is offering a food studies program in San Francisco. The School of Engineering and Computer Science started a master's in analytics, first offered in San Francisco this fall, and they have requested SIF Investments in order to expand it to Sacramento next January. And the Bennard School, which has actually done this without SIF investments, um, has an EDD program in Sacramento and now is expanding to include an MA program in education this fall. Wow, that is incredible. Let's give a hand to all the faculty and the schools in the college that are willing to stretch beyond their comfort zone to start offering these courses across the country. I will talk a little bit more about SIF in a moment, but I do want to take a moment and digress a little bit and reflect on what it means to be a one university that stretches across three campuses. So yesterday, a group of us were in Sacramento as we've been talking to them about ways in which we can have administrative partnerships so that we can serve well our new students and our new faculty that will be in Sacramento. Because before, when it was only the law school, it was pretty straightforward for the dean to make those decisions on both running the campus, providing the administrative services, that, as well as running the law school. A lot of those things that were, were done at, in Sacramento didn't have to be something the law school did if the law school was on the same, if, if everybody, if the whole university is on a single campus. So we went up and we talked with them, and we recognize that there's a lot of coordination. It takes academic support services, business and facility services, technology, student life, the library, all thinking differently about how we can better serve our students and our faculty. 
Now, the geographic distance between here and Sacramento also make it, makes it that much harder for the sort of collaboration that's needed for this sort of, for our one university, three cities to work. And in fact, I heard a couple of stories yesterday about situations where decisions made in Stockton made life harder for folks in Sacramento. And you know, I've heard similar stories over my seven years here. That there are times, and, and it's just different players, different scenarios, but a similar theme. <clears throat> and I think that one of our biggest challenges as we need to work across our boundaries is to make sure that we take the time to communicate and get to know one another. So if we're going to be changing a practice or a policy, that we make sure we give a call and get people together to discuss it. If we're going to be doing something here that has an impact elsewhere, or might, give a call and ask. If someone's calling for an exception to a rule that we might have, take time and really think about whether that we can be more flexible, especially if it's an exception around a student's need. And in fact, if you hear these stories, what you realize is that this is an issue and a challenge for us, even not across campus boundaries. And in fact, in our climate survey, one thing that came out was a concern about communications and collaborations. So I'm going to ask all of you, when you take actions, to think twice about the people that might not be in sight, might be far away, might be north of the Calaveras River, and think about the impact that that might have on others, and reach out, make a phone call. We'll also want to think about getting to know one another. Should we be having semester-based meetings of counterparts? Some folks do, some folks don't. Think about ways in which you and your group can get to know your counterparts elsewhere so that you have the vision of that face at the other end as we're all working together toward the common goal of supporting Pacificans supporting Pacificans. Back to SIF. The Strategic Investment Fund has not only invested in new degree programs that will expand the students that we serve. It's also there to support the services that we provide to our students, faculty, and staff on all three campuses. So I'll share with you some of the other important strategic investment fund investments that have been made in what we call building capacity. We have invested a significant amount to upgrade technology. Our technology team has done a fabulous job in both building up our foundations of technology as well as supporting specific initiatives. A special shout out this year in Sacramento, it has been a tremendous amount of work to upgrade the technology that was really, um, dare I assess, as um, greatly needing improvement in Sacramento, let's put it that way. And the accreditation expectations for the PA program, the Physician Assistant Program, <coughs> helped set a bar that is very high for not just basic technology infrastructure, but also classroom technology. Back to Strategic Investment Fund, they have, uh, SIF also helped advance our distance teaching and learning technology. It's supporting, helping support the Sacramento campus costs for three years while the law school gets on its feet and while new programs have time to build up enrollments that can then help cover the costs to run that campus. In addition, SIF has helped us enhance recruiting and marketing, especially of these new degree programs. And a recent 
uh, SIF proposal that was recommended to be supported by me and I'm recommending to the board, so some of these decisions haven't quite been made yet by the board, is to invest in the Career Resource Center. That proposal is to not only continue the good things that the uh, CRC has been doing, but expand them so that students are brought in early to think about what their goals are after they graduate so that they can be more intentional in how they pursue their education and their educational opportunities inside and outside the classroom while they're here. In addition, this SIF grant would enhance the career support and internship experiences available to the College of the Pacific liberal arts majors. It will expand our relationships with more employers and it will connect our students with our alumni to help build a strong network of Pacificans helping Pacificans. As you can see, the Strategic Investment Fund has had a tremendous impact on our university over the last two years. It is allowing us to be a better university, to reach more students, and to achieve an extraordinary future for our students and for the university. Now, I'd like us to look ahead for a few minutes. Would all the people that are in this room that have participated in developing our enrollment plan, put your hand up. You can have sat through town hall uh, meetings. You can be, uh, come on, how many of you have sat through listening to Jay Michael talk about enrollment? Oh, okay, there we are. We all love you, Jay Michael. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thinking about how we want to take our ambitious vision for our future that we're moving towards so well, and our vision for our academic future, and tie them to, well, how many students do we actually want to serve? How many can we serve? How many should we serve? Is extremely important. It's extremely important because it captures the power and the impact of a universe of Pacific education. It captures the nature of the mix of students that we have, undergraduate, graduate, uh, professional students, full-time, part-time, Stockton, Sacramento, San Francisco, all of these things. We, we need to have clarity in our goals. But in addition, it also helps us think about our strength and robustness as an institution and the nature of students that we have. So I'm going to share one bit of budget information for you, which is that about 85% of our unrestricted budget, so when you hear about the budget decisions each year, it's our unrestricted budget, 85% of that is from student tuition. And so there's a close tie between our enrollments and our budget. And in fact, in a time when tuition cannot be increased much because the cost of a college education has become so challenging for families that if our enrollments stay flat, tuition increases won't cover the increased costs of operating the university year to year. So it turns out to be very important that we grow enrollments, but we don't just want to grow enrollments for, grow, for, for the sake of having people here. We want to grow them strategically and thoughtfully and planfully. So I'd like to thank the Enrollment Plan Task Force, J. Michael, your leadership, and the sort of engagement we've had across the university in this effort. Um, J. Michael is, is very much aware, as, the, as, as a number of us are, that 
we've got a couple years of tough going with regard to enrollments. So I'll, I'll just share with you, our, our total university enrollments have dropped about 400 in the last five years. And that's largely because of the shift in demand for law schools, for a law education. That's okay, trends come and go. All we can do is be the very best for the times and McGeorge is doing that and that's great. But that's part of why we need to be looking at growing other segments of students that we're serving. Our undergraduate students, if you look at the demographics, is about a flat number of undergrads in the West who are graduating from high school college ready. And so it's becoming harder and harder to recruit undergraduates, especially when you recognize that there's way less potential undergraduates back east, where all these private universities have all of a sudden discovered California. And so there is a lot of competition for students that might want to come to University of the Pacific. As you may have heard from J. Michael, one of our challenges here is about nine years ago, or 10 years ago, we took an approach that had real potential and we partnered with a company called Royal that does recruiting predominantly online. Oh, that's not fair. They do wide recruiting both digitally as well as with postcards and other materials, uh, but make it super, super easy for anyone to click here and apply to the University of the Pacific. So we ended up in one year having 21,000 applications for our freshman class, which seemed like a cause to celebrate, except for the poor people in and, uh, admissions who had to process those 21,000. And then it turns out that only a fraction of those were actually fully completed. And then when they admitted the number of students to come to Pacific, only what are our worst year, nine out of 100 who were admitted chose to come. And what that sh demonstrated was that, um, and by the way, that, that uh, nine out of 100, that's yield. The yield of the admitted to actually showing up. What that showed is that the sort of royal approach, while it got interest in clicking a button, it didn't get people who really knew about us and wanted to be at Pacific. And in fact, the other front, um, negative of that approach to recruiting is that there wasn't that personal relationship between the student that we're recruiting and the university. And yet that's a hallmark of a University of the Pacific education. And so I'd like to applaud J. Michael and the provost for recognizing that we need to shift and we've been doing this over a number of years. But that means that we're also now, during a time when it's that much more competition for undergrads, we're also making changes. And so it's much harder to predict just how many freshmen we'll have coming. Um, but it's the right thing to do, and we're doing great. We're also, We've got these new initiatives, these new grad programs that are going to reach more students, but it's gonna take time for those programs to grow and the uh, difference the student's tuition can make overall. So this long story is to say, bottom line, as we look out the next couple of years, we're probably looking at flat enrollments. So if you remember what I said, that with flat enrollments and tuition not able to go up much, it's gonna be tight budget for a couple of years. Now, I'm not worried because I know that we're doing the right things and that this is a period of transition for us as a university. But we'll probably need to tighten our belts and recognize that we're on the right path, we're doing the right things. And that the most important thing is that we continue to focus on what we're about, which is transforming students' lives and providing them the most outstanding education possible. Because I cannot imagine, and I suspect that's true for everyone, the rest of you in this room, cannot imagine a better university 
for a student to study at, whether they're a working adult or whether they're an 18-year-old coming confused about what life is about, couldn't be a better, better place for them to get an education. So I'm going to segue now to one of the greatest honors that I have, and that is being part of our campaign, Leading with Purpose. Because I get to go out and talk to our alumni and our donors and our friends about all that is great about University of the Pacific. We, are, we have a goal of $300 million as our campaign goal. We have, hmm, Bernie, I know it changes every day. Um, do you want to share the latest okay. number? He's <laughs> opening his file because he's got to win them. He doesn't go anywhere without the numbers. Uh, Bernie, we love you, though. Approximately 126.23. 126, <laughs> really? We're over 125? Thereabouts, yeah. That is fabulous. So just to let you know, the way campaigns work is that when you reach halfway, it goes from what we call a silent or a quiet phase to a more public celebratory phase. Um, and we, are, we will likely pass that halfway mark sooner than we plan to go public. We'll probably go public a year. Am I, am I speaking out of school? No. Is that, is that right? Okay, okay. As long as that gift we were talking about comes through. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay. It's like, I hate to announce things here that the regents don't know about. Um, but we're going to talk to them about um, going public a year from this October so we can do a lot of planning and have a big celebration. Uh, but it, it's so exciting because every time we talk to our donors, what compels them is not only a belief in University of the Pacific and the education we provide, but also a passion to give back to help others experience that education. And in fact, we have, have we hit 100 new endowments that are matched by the Powell gift, which is an, another major milestone. So if you'll bear with me just for a moment. Oh, Bernie wants to clap. Let's <laughs> clap. So if you'll bear with me just a moment, I'd like to show you a beautiful video that honors our do donors and our students. Rebecca, thank you. I had a dream which I thought I would never be able to fulfill. I said, if I ever get enough money, I'm going to start a scholarship. The Powell Match of the University of Pacific, of course, that was one of the greatest gifts Pacific has ever re received in its history. I had no idea that you could get matching funds from it. And uh, what it's done is allowed us to reach our seven-figure goal. My name is Rebecca, I'm Rebecca Berryman, and I received the Audison Scholarship. I still can't believe that I am receiving this scholarship from people who never met me, who never knew who I was, but decided to open their hearts and really reach out and make sure that people are able to stay in school. My name is Diana Wang. I am a fifth year at the University of the Pacific. This past May, I received a Dr. Min Outstanding Junior Scholarship, and it's given me the extra boost to finish my education here at the University of the Pacific. When we started the scholarship, we didn't know we were gonna ever meet any of them, but we just thought, you know, we were gonna give them money, and, that was it. and it would help students. My name is Ryan Fidrizi. So I am a recipient of the Thomas J. Long and Mario Long Foundation Scholarship. And hopefully one day, through my experience here, we will eventually uncover something monumental and we'll be able to help find a better drug target to treat Parkinson's disease. My name is Sarah Jordan. I am going to be graduating in the year of 2016. Once I heard I received the Face Bando Scholarship, I was deeply honored. And honestly, I was full of gratitude because honestly, without those scholarships, I would not be able to continue here at the University of the Pacific. When you see these children graduate, 
When you, when you have them once in a while send you a note you don't expect or get a phone call that comes from out of the blue, that's, wh that's where your money comes back full fold. This letter we just received, she said, I received this letter and it said, congratulations. And she said, my father just died. Why would I receive congratulations? And then she saw that she got her senior year of the scholarship again. I have had a really hard time trying to understand how to thank the Audisons for the gift that they've given me. So I've written them letters, um, just trying to give them a little glimpse into who I am and who the person that they're sponsoring is, so that they can really understand that like, their generosity has really impacted my life in a very positive way. And because of them, I will be able to keep my promise to stay in school that I made to my dad. People always uh, say, you know, how does giving affect you? And that's the wrong type of question to ask. The question is, how does it affect the people who are the recipient of the financial aid? reminds all of us of why we're here every day and the difference that we make. So thank you for everything that you do. Okay, I would be happy to take any questions. Well, I'll start. Oh, oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Langer. Mayor's a professor. You are talking about uh, the university having a presence in both Sacramento yeah. and San Francisco. Uh, to what extent are we actually employing faculty that will be in Sacramento and in San Francisco permanently? as opposed to expecting faculty here in Stockton to travel to each of those places? That's a great question. Um, we've hired, there's going to be a, a real mix on how these courses are provided. Um, quite a number of people have been hired that will be per, uh, permanently in, in those cities. Uh, we are also using some faculty that are based in that area who are teaching part-time. We're using technology to help deliver the courses, and we have some wonderful faculty who are willing to drive to teach a course once a week or every other week, alternate where the course is being offered. There's a lot of creative ways in which courses are being delivered, and they're being experimented with. And that's the best thing to happen, because that way our faculty can best understand where and how it makes the most sense, depending on what's being taught, who's being ta and who's being taught. Thank you. You're welcome. There's a question that came online that was, um, what is my vision for reaching out and serving adult learners or working adults who want to start or finish their bachelor's degree. And this is called degree completion. Um, I think that there's possibilities in that. Right now we're focusing on building our graduate programs in these cities, making sure we do that well. But um, I, I suspect that the provost <coughs> and others are considering ways that we can provide that access to an affordable bachelor's degree that doesn't require um, actually coming and living on the Stockton campus. But there are no plans right now in that direction. Other questions? Okay, I've got another one. <laughs> this is one from a student, and it's for you, Ken. 
Will the ban, will the ban on hoverboards ever be lifted? Should I return the one I bought for school? Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Oh, we've got a microphone. Both of us, really. Yeah. Go ahead, stand up. Right so, uh, is that on? Anyway, uh, well, there it is. Um, Can why don't you come up to the podium so that uh, I'll cast? Uh, so I know uh, Patrick Day and I have been working on this. Uh, I leave my hoverboard at home uh, every morning. <laughs> I didn't even know what one was. Uh, uh, but you know, we have to really be careful with uh, risk management and our insurance companies and protecting the liability of the institution and to protect our students. So uh, that decision has been made and Patrick, I don't know what you, uh, other conversations you've had, but uh, really it's with our insurers and our risk manager that that, uh, that decision was made. So, okay. And I'll sit down. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You know, this is something that we, we didn't just do this on the whim. In fact, I really challenge our staff to say, is this really, we can't just react because of a couple of news stories, but we looked at the consumer product safety information and it was becoming increasingly clear over time that the real risk was we just didn't know what was happening with an entire industry. I mean, some of you know over the holidays, if this was taken off Amazon, and this was not a small matter. So this is very, very, very clear. This is to be a temporary measure that we are going to revisit. We don't just want to close down indefinitely something that is important to our students. Thank you. So um, I just got a question online, and the question was, do we have an intention to increase the diversity of our students here? And really, that could be looked at in two ways, both from sort of an enrollment plan perspective, but also, what are we doing to enhance diversity at the university? I'd like to recognize Chris Goff, uh, Steve Robinson, and Sandra Rooney. Pardon? Excuse me. What's my phone? Robinson. Hey, I'm sorry. Oh, that was an old friend of mine from college. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Jacobson. Anyway, um, the three of them uh, uh, have, uh, I'm deeply appreciative of their willingness to be a diversity team uh, where they represent faculty, students, and staff. And working together are looking at our diversity strategic plan that was developed a number of years ago and identifying what are the most important things that we should be tackling to make a difference around diversity at University of the Pacific. Chris, do you want to share what the group has been doing? Sure. Hi. Um, yes, as, as the president said, I'm Chris Bach, Assistant Provost for Diversity, um, and a professor in the math department. And I see you in the Is Sandra here? Yeah, there she is. Okay. Um, so, yes, uh, we, I will let you know what we've been working on over the, after finals week and then early before the semester began. Um, we met a few times to look at um, the results of the open forums and all the other interviews that we, we did last semester. So we've been gathering a lot of information and now we've been putting it together into a prioritization plan. We are almost done polishing our first draft of that plan, which we will then begin to share in a series of more open forums and going to other uh, meetings such as the council deans, um, the um, the TAB, Assistant and Associate Dean, ASULP, Staff Advisory Council, Academic Council, things like that. Um, so, but I can tell you definitely the, well, I don't know if it's definite at this point, we're still polishing, but the main priority that has been rising up through all these conversations is to get more diverse student body on campus, more diverse faculty, and more diverse staff. So we're going to be looking at recruitment and retention efforts um, in all those areas. So that's really the, the top priority. There are other priorities coming up, but you will see, so stay tuned. You will be seeing more uh, about this this semester. Yeah. Thanks so much, Chris. Sure. And you will see that uh, commitment to increasing the diversity of our students 
in the enrollment plan as well. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm very little for you, but um, my name is Stacy Church. I'm the Director of Counseling and Psychological Services. Um, we've had a presence on two of our three campuses for 11 years now, so I just really want to shout out to you folks because I think we're kind of pioneers in that way. Um, but I wonder if you might say something about um, how my colleagues and staff will um, be supported and what is the plan for the three campus um, that's a great question and it's probably on so many people's minds who provide staff support that now has implications across the three campuses and um, your question of how are we going to support staff in that area you know it's going to end up being um, so uh, support specific because the nature of the cross-campus collaborations will differ depending on the nature of what support is being provided. Um, what we have to do is figure out ways that we don't burn people out, that we don't spend all of our time on the road going back and forth, that we do take advantage of technology as much as possible, and I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg of how technology can provide um, almost a seamless virtual support so that it doesn't matter where the faculty, staff, or student is based, they can access it. Now, you're probably thinking that day is a little ways away from today. And so that's why we need to be thinking about a transition. The other challenge is that we, we, we've got a tight budget, and we also don't want to um, hire too many staff before we have the students to be serving. And so how do we grow in a planful way? Can we have one person sort of serving multiple roles, especially through cross-training and understanding, so that we can help with this transition period until we have sufficient number of students to then expand the services on Sacramento and San Francisco. Uh, so we're going to need a lot of people to be part of these discussions. Uh, the area of wellness and counseling, we're actually bringing in some folks to help us review and develop a plan this semester. Uh, I think that some areas are already pretty um, well coordinated. Uh, uh, development and fundraising has been looking at this for a number of years as our campaign is of course across university. But there are other folks where it's brand new really thinking about how we provide those services. Or for example, disability services, so important on each campus. Danny Ness is just one person, um, a well-loved one person, but um, how can we help uh, ex expand that? So I don't have easy answers, but what I can say is we, we are going to be planful and deliberate and have the people involved around the table to talk about the best way to solve that problem. Thank you. So you mentioned a couple of times about tight years ahead of this budget possible reallocations or cuts that might have to be made. Are there any particular areas that are in discussion that you might be looking at to affect those cuts or if we should start planning and preparing for something? Um, first of all, I'd like to invite all of you to, uh, no, let me back up. We have a wonderful budget committee, the ITC, the uh, Institutional Priorities Committee, that looks at the budget in the context of the institutional priorities. And uh, Lydia Foss has done a great job <coughs> in chairing it this year. And she has wondered how come her year of chairing this <laughs> ends up with um, uh, some of these challenges. But they're thinking uh, strongly about it. And we have a budget town hall. And that is scheduled for February 23rd from 3 to 5 right here in Grace Covell. Mm -hmm. And it will be webcast. And so the IPC will be bringing forward some of their ideas and plans. <laughs> Don't expect something drastic. Um, I think that all of us will be able to get through. It'll be, um, I'm hoping, a predominantly inconvenient, some impact, um, uh, but 
our intention is not to have a large sweeping impact at the university, but more of all of us tightening our belts. It, it may impact raises, the size of raises, the ability to do raises, but it shouldn't impact any sort of layoffs or things like that. All of us will be. What I really hope comes out of these couple years, though, is all of us think about, gee, are there ways that we can do things differently to save money as an institution? Um, and I always love looking at Ken, uh, but because he knows it's coming. You know, are there ways that we can purchase through group purchasing agreements to help reduce costs and, and other things like that? So I think that there'll be really healthy uh, results with it. So don't get worried, don't get panicked, but come, be informed, and uh, do come to the town hall. Yes, ma'am. But I can 
understand that it feels and it looks as if it's just this big growth in the administration, but it's a growth in both hands. But it's all it's, it's always a good question and always a growth. Okay. Oh, oh yes, sir. Question that here. wow, I really want to go here because you're right. Uh, the quality of facilities act as a surrogate for a potential student and their parent. Um, if, if the buildings are shabby, the students say, gee, maybe this, or, and the parents say, gee, maybe this university doesn't have enough money to take care of me or, or my kid. Um, now, there's mo many ways to look at this. Technology upgrades in the classrooms. Uh, uh, Vernon, you can address that. Um, but before you talk about that, I will share, we, we're not doing a lot of facility upgrades. We'd love to build a new chemistry building. We'd love to build a new this and that building. But what we have focused on is housing, because our housing is so far behind that it is actually a detriment in our ability to recruit uh, freshmen. And we think it might also impact retention to some extent. But uh, I'd really like to answer, since you're looking at it from a technology perspective, the technology question about technology in the classrooms. Is that burning? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, okay. Just and Aaron's bringing the microphone for you. Just briefly, um, as you're aware, there, um, they need variation. And, and so part of, part of our approach is to understand what are the best tools this. And so as part of the city funding, of course, we want to do the learning management system, which is going to help with uh, a uh, more, uh, I would say, robust uh, ways of approaching that. But in the classrooms themselves, there's some things that have been happening. And we're doing it in incremental improvement. You'll remember, I don't know how many of you participated in the VHS buyback last year. Anyone? <laughs> you wrote this last year? Okay, so you did, you did okay. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right, yes, um, it, and uh, one of the things you know, we noticed is that, for example, that we did the VHS in the classroom. Now by doing the VHS buyback, and we have to make sure everyone gets all the neutral stuff after, if it's not there, I don't know about that. Um, uh, we're able to then upgrade that, and so if we've taken that incremental approach, even though it's a small approach, it's, it's doing it and saying, what's going to work, what can we do right now, what's in our control? And I think that's probably an example of what we need to do. But I think President Ivan, uh, it nailed it when she talked about uh, the residential facilities are probably the thing that attracts and gets the students' attention more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple of facts, and then I really want to let you guys go. Uh, on facilities, uh, even though I mentioned chemistry, but the conservatory is music, there's the pharmacy and health sciences, I mean, you name it, there's a whole suite of buildings. Lyndall Phillips could use a, a, a freshen up, uh, et cetera. Um, and in fact, we have a master plan and a list of projects that we'd like to do. And it, it's, it's a tight time. It's going to be tough to get to. The way we're able to do housing right away is that we're actually partnering with an external partner. And so we are providing them with a lease of, of the use of our land for a number of years, for 50 years. And they're going to come in and build the residence and it will not be on our budget, and it will be, not be on our debt. If all goes well, and it should be. Uh, Ken and Patrick and the team have done a great job. So this is an example of ways in which we can continually improve, but have partners in that effort. The other thing that we're saying is that any new buildings, any new construction, needs to have donor support. I mean, like, 90% donor support, and that and that's 
another way in which we can continually improve our facilities, but recognize the uh, financial realities of higher education today. You guys have been wonderful. You've said, paid attention so much. You've really been engaged. Thank you very much for everything you've done, not just now, but throughout the year for our students and year end.